Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, before I was elected to the European Parliament, I used to be a political theorist, and now I'm a political practitioner. The combination is a fascinating one. Uh, I'm going to talk much more as a political theorist than as a political practitioner this afternoon. Um, and what I want to start out by suggesting to you is that when we look at this whole problem, and much of what I've heard today has been extremely interesting and ties in very well uh, with what I'm going to say, indeed the last uh, comments about the nature of power I think are extremely relevant to what I have to say. Basically what I'm trying to get at here is that language maintenance has an unacknowledged power political dimension. And we can't really understand adequately what we're talking about if we don't look at it at the same time. I mean, all sorts of factors uh, can be uh, put into it uh, through theories of power. Because it seems to me that any system of power, any site of power, necessarily has a linguistic dimension. Uh, what uh, institutions of power attempt to do is to condense meaning, to intensify the exercise of power through linguistic concentration. The ne plus ultra of this, of course, is Orwell's Newspeak. You may remember in 1984 that Newspeak was the language that lost vocabulary every year. It's, it's a great insight. Um, I think it follows logically that condensing, in the way that I've defined it, is necessarily intolerant of alternatives. Uh, above all of other languages, uh, and even of dialect variants, um, especially if they're written. Let me give you one example, which may or may not be known to you. Um, there's an obscure dialect, not, obviously not obscure to the people who speak it, called Lachian. It's on the sort of Polish-Czech borderlands, and it has elements of both in it. Um, the Czech authorities effectively banned the poet uh, Andrzej Lisohorski from, from publishing in this language. He was a communist, he'd been a member of the pre-war communist party. Nevertheless, this is not a language which could be written, not a shift dialect, simply not accepted because presumably it challenges the primacy of Czech in that particular instance. Presumably, I suppose, if it had been on the other side of the border, it would have challenged the primacy of Polish. Uh, or think about the amused contempt of the English for Scots. Is it a language? Is it a dialect? Is it simply a form of articulation, a sort of, a sort of a form of expression? Um, what I'm suggesting here is that there are actually severe limits to the, I'm going to call it the ideology of multiculturalism and diversity. These are m much, much narrower than we think. My, I focus on Europe because this is what I know. Now, the more extensive the the functions which can be performed in a language, the better the chances of its reproduction. And majorities understand this instinctively, if you like, and will therefore seek to restrict minority languages. Above all, I think they seek to provincialize it. There's a hierarchy into which they put local languages, dialects, or other languages to the best of their ability. It seems to me that the but we have something which I'm going to call the language power <coughs> complex. And the summit of this is the sovereign state. Uh, the sovereign state has exclusive monopoly over the language of its territory. Uh, think about Kurdish, which is spoken by maybe 25 million people. They were promised a state at the end of the First World War. They did not get a state, uh, beginning to develop one in Iraq at the moment. Um, and without the state power, it seems to me that the Kurds have considerable difficulty in agreeing on a single standard. There are a great number of dialects. Uh, once you have a state, of course, this becomes another matter entirely. You can legislate for what the language should, uh, should contain. Uh, not only that, once you have this situation of a state language that allows the organs of the state to operate as agents of linguistic reproduction, which again necessarily places them in a stronger position than those forms of expression which lack this. So what we're talking about uh, is modernity. 
which I'm not going to define because I think that requires at least one other lecture or possibly several more. It's a very contested, but I think at the same time uh, there is a common sense uh, understanding of it. In conditions of modernity, minority languages are necessarily at a disadvantage. And the acquisition of political power by a minority language group must be therefore become logically um, a major, indeed I think the central cultural objective, because it raises the demand that minority languages within a particular uh, political framework, political context, um, are making a claim to be languages of modernity as well as the language of the majority. This sets up a political contest which is always going to be a difficult one. Um, far too often, um, the majority language is regarded by members of the minority as the most effective avenue of upward mobility, of success in life. The classic French Republican model is about this. The, the parler, which are marginalized at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. It's, it's an extraordinary um, experiment, a successful experiment, actually, in social engineering. Um, this has been widely adopted by Liberal Democrats, and in, including, by the way, John Stuart Mill. Read what he says about languages like Welsh and Scottish Gaelic, not very well disposed towards them. And, of course, Marx and Engels, likewise, had a rather poor opinion. Um, uh, what did Engels? He talked about Trümmerhaufen, heaps of ruins. I can't quote you the exact place. This is about 1848-49. Now, we should be aware, therefore, that the prestige of the majority language um, as the primary language of modernity impacts uh, very negatively on minority languages. I think that's what I've been taken from the various discussions this afternoon, <coughs> among other things, uh, regarding the Finnish languages in Russia. Um, the contest with Russian is very unequal. And you may want to note that even in Finland, which we all regard as a, a very good case, um, Finland Swedes feel at a disadvantage. Um, it's not as far reaching as some others I could mention, but still, again, the hierarchy operates. And I talked to some of my Finland Swedish friends, and they will confirm this. Now, from the perspective of the majority, on the other hand, the demands for lang minority language maintenance are seen, or can be seen, as a threat to the integrity of the state. Can you have a state with more than one language? And the answer is with difficulty. Um, if you look at it from the perspective of sociological reality, it is difficult to maintain an efficient, high-capacity, bilingual state, let alone a multilingual state. It can be done, but it's very hard work and requires well, I would say discipline and probably also some extreme self-limitation on the part of all the groups. Geographical separation makes it easy. I'm thinking here of Belgium, with basically three languages. We can all fundamentally forget about uh, German. Uh, but even then, where the geographical separation is very, very clear, there's a very clear uh, language frontier, there's still very interesting overlapping cases which create terrible difficulties. I'm not going to talk to you about it in great detail, but be aware of it. And then, of course, the whole question of parallel societies. They do exist very widely um, when two language groups live commingled, but actually don't talk to each other very much. Um, what is to be done about this? How, how do you then ensure that both groups feel equally at home in terms of uh, cultural reproduction? Note here that universalistic ideologies are hostile, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, to arrangements like geographical separation, parallel societies, minority language maintenance, and they're repeatedly, regularly dismissed as backward, reactionary. So in this sense, almost by definition, universalism is hostile to minority language reproduction. And I want to add here that although universalists claim that there is a single universal humanity, if you actually probe it uh, more closely, you will see that every universalism is contingent. Every universalism has its own language, if you like. Um, I think I can safely say that Anglo-Saxon universalism really is very different from French universalism. I think you'd agree. Uh, German universalism, 
not that strong at the moment, but it has been in the past. Russian universalism, which in a sense is one of the key issues uh, in the context of the Finno-Ugrian languages. I don't want to go too deeply into this because that takes me into thought style theory, uh, which is in itself a fascinating area, but not, not a central concern in this context. I have done some work on it. The, I, the locus classicus, the references, is Mary Douglas's work. So the next point I want to make is it's about Babel. Is it the curse of Babel or is it the blessing of Babel? Um, we talk about biodiversity. Can't we also talk about glottodiversity? Uh, for those of you who are classicists will be upset by my mixing of Latin and Greek, but I think that we can, I'll get by. There are so few classicists left in the world anyway. Um, I'm the generation that still learned Latin but not Greek. Um, in a sense, what I'm saying here is that the existence of multiplicity in language allows us greater access to the construction of alternatives, innovation. Um, but the problem, of course, is with the reality-defining agents. It's the sites of power that I've been talking about um, who don't like it uh, because they want, as I suggest at the beginning, to condense power. It disturbs the harmony, the balance, if you like, the equilibrium within a particular language community. And, of course, it does open up the possibility of change. Now, again, theories of change are a fascinating area. I haven't time to go into great detail, but I will say this, that on the whole, while people talk about how wonderful change is, most people dislike it. Most people accumulate cultural capital in their lifetimes. They really don't like it when they have to change this, which is, of course, why, if you like, revolutions are really a very disturbing uh, event. They may be necessary. Um, in a democracy, I think this is a, a central tenet of democracy theory, power is to be applied with self-limitation. In this context of majority and minority of different language groups, clearly it's essential that a majority should apply self-limitation to the way in which uh, power is exercised regarding the minority. Very nice, doesn't happen in practice all that often. Um, minority language protection tends to be restricted to education, culture, possibly local government, religious, uh, possibly. Uh, majorities tend to the best of their ability to circumscribe these areas, to limit them, and indeed prefer, and I think this is actually very interesting, they prefer to impose majority norms in the minority language. For example, if you take minority schooling in a number of places that I could mention, it's not 100%, but there is a preference to teach the history of the majority in the minority language. The minority may have its own completely different history, but that tends to be under pressure uh, pretty much at all time. And my experiences in Central Europe is that the private sector is even more restrictive. There are exceptions to this. Um, I remember being in a supermarket in southern Slovakia, in Dunajska Dunajskastreda, 80% Hungarian. Everything was up in Slovak and not in Hungarian. Why, I wonder? I leave the question open. Um, in addition to the hegemonic culture of the state, which in a sense is uh, at the heart of what I'm saying, uh, there is a myth symbol complex to which minority norms uh, are very seldom admitted. Uh, think about flags and how, on the whole, majorities deeply dislike minority flags. In Romania, you may know, uh, the display of the Hungarian flag is actually forbidden. Uh, I remember being up in the Sekla land, in Gyergyo, in the restaurant, this is about 10, 12 years ago. It's strange to say, um, the curtains were red, the serviettes were green, and the tablecloths were white. What a strange coincidence. Happens to be the Hungarian, because Hungarian flag, oh, perish the thought. They knew absolutely what they were doing. And it seems to me that this is a very good, very low level example of identity reproduction. Um, but there is the problem that the way in which the state organized, the institutional norms, the naturalized assumptions, the Bourdieu's doxa, the implicit meanings that Mary Douglas uses, they all tend to militate <coughs> against the minority language. And as a result, will inevitably accelerate erosion. Let me move on and talk a little bit, I think I've got time, um, if I'm going to use my half hour, I certainly have the time, 
uh, but I, I don't want to keep you from what's going to follow later on. The role of the kin state. Um, this is a much disputed area, and it's actually very difficult to know what a kin state can do without endangering the other state, the neighbouring state. Some are quite inactive. Germany, for example, doesn't play much of a role with respect to the uh, various transfrontier minority. So I'm not going to talk about that, but this won't surprise you. I will talk about the Hungarian case. The Hungarian case, in many ways, is certainly special, unique. We can argue about whether or not it's unique. Um, in simple terms, 1920, every Hungarian knows this, Trianon transferred around one-third of the language community uh, to, the Hung to Hungary's successor states. They acquired new citizenships, I will add, without their consent. They were never asked whether they wanted to become Czechoslovak or Romanian or there was no Yugoslavia at that time, it was as high as kingdom. Uh, they wanted these citizenships, but that's what they were effectively given. It seems to me that in terms of democratic theory, this is intolerable, but we're 90 years on. So about th over three million people were affected. It's actually a not inconsiderable number. Now, the point I'm getting at here is that not all, but the overwhelming majority of these people had already been inducted into a Hungarian model of modernity. And the great majority, and in a way this is surprising, remained, has remained attached to a Hungarian identity and have been transmitting it to the next generation. Um, much to the dismay, I have to say, of the successor states, not surprisingly. Um, often in the face of enormous majority pressure. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, sometime, if you've got time, have a look at what happened to the Hungarian minority in Slovakia in 1945-48. Um, there's actually a very good book on this by Janic um, Kalman. It, it exists in English, not just in Hungarian. You don't have to know Hungarian for salvation. It helps, but uh, it's not, not essential. Um, I should also add here that it, as a result of Trianon and the transfer of, of territory and population, probably about half a million people dissimilated immediately. These were people who were capable in both languages. When the Slovaks were, when the Czechs were there, they were Slovaks. When the Hungarians were there, they were Hungarian. Uh, you had the same thing in Romania, and to some degree, to, I think to a lesser extent, in, in, in what became Yugoslavia. Um, now, let me skip a large number of decades, 1990s. Uh, the Hungarian state, as kin state, elaborated a policy of establishing cultural, economic, political, and eventually legal links with the Hungarian societies, societies uh, beyond the frontiers. The first stage was the status law, and this was de facto abandoned uh, when the left-wing government came to power in 2002. 2010, there's a centre-right government, my party as it happens, which elaborated a new citizenship law uh, which made provision for the acquisition of Hungarian citizenship on the basis of individual application. Now, I want to add here that this law closely follows the Slovak, Croatian and Romanian precedents. Um, indeed, uh, all the, the, the wording of the Romanian law has been all taken over almost word for word. Not, I have to say, that this is readily acknowledged by uh, Slovak, Croatian and Romanians, but that's another story. Um, I don't have the latest figure of the number who have applied for Hungarian citizenship, but it is running into the hundreds of thousands. Um, and this is interesting, because what, we're, what is happening here is the extension of a state identity to a transfrontier group, uh, several transfrontier groups, if we're going to be accurate about it, including the right to vote. Not unique. Uh, Italy has a law along these lines. Um, I'm not sure since when. I think there's a, uh, I think they have seven seats in the Senate and I've forgotten how many in the Chamber of Deputies, which are elected entirely by overseas extra-Italian Italians. Several hundred, I think several hundred thousand in Argentina, for example, in Australia. Uh, there are even some Italians in Hungary who vote in this particular way. Um, now, I see the objective of this, although I guess it's not been made public in this way, uh, that there's a 
steady, there's a, uh, this concern at the steady erosion of Hungarian speakers in the transfrontier communities. Um, I haven't got the exact figure in my head, but the community in Slovakia dropped by about 60,000 out of half a million. Um, the figure in Transylvania, in Romania, is analogous to this. Um, why? Well, partly it's out-migration. Out-migration to Hungary, out-migration to other parts of Europe, elsewhere, um, partly also through differential birth rates. Hungarian birth rates tend to be lower, not invariably, but tend to be lower. Demographic pressure. Um, here, I think the city of Cluj, Kolozsvár, Klausenburg, Napoca, uh, take your pick, um, is very interesting where the demographic pressure uh, is thus, it was working in such a way as to shrink the size of the Hungarian community, even if the size of it is not going down so all that much in absolute terms, in relative size terms it is. And this creates a very interesting pressure, which we've seen elsewhere, where a language community feels that it really doesn't have a future in that particular uh, place. The, the, cl the classic example of this actually uh, the Germans of Prague before the First World War, who knew that they'd lost the demographic game. Uh, Rilke, uh, um, others whose writing in a way reflects this at some level, uh, or Serbs in Kosovo, very similar example. And I think this is happening in the towns of Transylvania, which once upon a time had Hungarian majorities, but that was a long time ago. Um, so in a sense, uh, we're looking at a situation where the demographic pressure is shifting the overall balance. I would add here that the minorities themselves are to some extent at fault in that, and again this I think has come up in different contexts with the Komi, um, they do not develop uh, m models of urban living, models of modernity in the minority. It's not an easy thing to do, I recognize that, but they don't do it. Um, it is very difficult, in a way, to develop transfrontier models of modernity and thereby stem assimilation. But if it's not being done, then the assimilation will grow apace because the moment that somebody migrates from town to country, which is one of the great dynamics of the uh, 20th and 21st centuries, they will inevitably find that the majority uh, models are more attractive and more successful, whatever. I think it's a perfectly understandable human response. Um, the new citizenship law actually tries to turn this round and to offer some kind of relationship, a civic relationship, with the Hungarian state. Um, and it's also taking another look at language. Can you be a Hungarian without speaking Hungarian? Uh, the new law says, well, yes, to some degree, maybe you can. Uh, if you're the descendant of Hungarians, uh, you can trace the ascent in a direct line, you can apply for Hungarian citizenship, and you get it. This applies particularly to North America, but also other parts of the world. Um, so provisionally, it's all very tentative. I think we're looking at a situation where, in this case study, uh, there will be a given number of Hungarians, we don't know exactly how many, who won't know Hungarian. Um, they may just know who Koshit is, they may just know who Petrov is, but I think they will certainly find Hungary quite alien. Um, most people who are not Hungarian do find Hungary alien, and as a matter of fact, so do the transfrontier Hungarians, but that's a separate story uh, which really does deserve further investigation. Um, there are cases, this is the question of language and power, um, where decisions by a majority to extend the political functions of minority language has improved, uh, has resulted in a marked improvement in minority language maintenance. Uh, I'm thinking of Wales, Dr. Hainap, who has referred to Wales. And I would add here that this happened almost by stealth. I mean, I lived through this entire process when I was living in Britain. I don't remember much of the debate. I mean, I remember Gwynver Evans threatening to starve himself to death. And the government just caved in on it and said, OK, let the Welsh have their Welsh language television channel, S. Pedwarak, uh, S4C in English. So what I'm getting at here, uh, this is the last point I want to make, is that this power language complex is a vital perspective on minority language maintenance. And I think we should add to this the models of modernity uh, without which um, 
cultural reproduction becomes much more difficult. So access to political power on the part of the minority and um, self-limitation by the majority are essential elements of this endeavor. Thank you for your attention.